Hey everybody, my name is Dave Snyder. This is my video series on customizing the Linux desktop. Uh, we started with the USB drive. We're moving all the way to a fully uh, customized development environment. So uh, last we left, we'd installed the pop window shell, uh, pop shell uh, for tiling windows, uh, which gave us nice tiling window stuff. And I promised this video would be about terminals. Uh, specifically, we're gonna install Alacrity. We're going to do a very, very basic setup of the NeoVim editor, uh, though you're welcome to use your own uh, uh, code editor or whatever you want on that side of it. Uh, we're also just going to do some very easy tweaks to things like fonts and system settings. So let's get started with it. All right, so here we are. Um, we're in here. The I mentioned talking about fonts and getting some of that type of stuff set up. Uh, so I am going to jump into my terminal here. Uh, let's also get a Firefox going. And I'm gonna install two different fonts for us. Uh, one is going to be our monospace font that we wanna use, and the other one's just gonna be like our general system font that we'd like to use. Um, so to start with a system font, um, I like using one called Inter. Uh, so if we come in here and look for Inter font, uh, we're gonna see uh, this font that was made by Rasmus. He's the designer that made Spotify. He made Figma. Uh, he was on, I believe, the founding teams of both of them. In his spare time when he's not <laughs> building uh, these little uh, Linux subsystems, he also does uh, font stuff. He's a, he's a regular Benjamin Franklin, like autodidact crazy man. Um, I love this font. Uh, I've used it a couple different companies and Whenever I want to set up my Linux system, I also like changing the font on that side of it. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and install that font, uh, which again, we're just gonna do a EA-S, and then I believe it's just enter font uh, for this one. So yes, you can even install fonts with um, you know the Pac-Man and Yay system. So now we have that font system in there. Uh, we should be able to see it if we come into fonts here, and if we look for enter, uh, we can see that the inter fonts were installed. Like it, it's that quick, it's really nice, uh, super easy to mess with on that side of it. Now, at this point, if we wanted to use that font for our system level stuff, so right now, uh, the font that's being used is the one that ships by default with GNOME, uh, but you know, maybe we don't like it, we wanna change it out. Um, we can now come into the tweaks area uh, and this is gonna load up the tweaks. It's gonna say, hey, extension management's moved. It's just giving us like a nice helper uh, for it. And you can see uh, this has some settings that we can go through to start changing the way uh, that GNOME looks. So for example, if we didn't want the date up there, we could turn that off. We could put the weekday to let us know that it's Tuesday. We could put week numbers. I don't even know what that is. Uh, we could put the seconds if we were absolutely crazy and wanted something moving on our screen at all times. Uh, but what we really wanted to do was come in here and set the interface uh, and document font to enter. Uh, so I'm just gonna use, for interface text, we got a couple different choices that we could use here. I'm going to use enter medium for it. And if we select that, we can see that everything changed on us. Uh, for our document text, uh, let's change intermedium as well. Hit select. Uh, let's change this one actually to maybe interbold. How does that look? It's starting to look kind of nice. I think I like the look at this. Anyways, that's now gone through and anything that uses GNOME uh, is also going to get this font setting and, and have these changes with us as well. Um, so everything's looking pretty sweet uh, from this part, uh, probably for these legacy video, uh, legacy tiles as well. We're gonna wanna set these to enter bold as well, make a setting, uh, and we've changed that. Now for our monospace text, that's things that are going to show up anytime that we're using, um, uh, that a system is passing something down to a terminal side of thing. And this is our one where we're gonna start talking about terminals. Uh, which means I got to start talking to you about the crazy world of how people interspose glyph icons into fonts. And what am I talking about? 
I'm talking about our friend nerd fonts. So nerd fonts are basically these, uh, they're basic, how could I explain them? They, you essentially take a bunch of glyphs and by glyphs, I mean icon systems, and then you merge them with a font system so that the fonts show up as glyphs. Uh, and if everybody ends up doing this and they do this for all, you know, some of the more popular monospace fonts, then it means that terminal authors can start using these things uh, regularly. So if you're running a Vim uh, uh, file and you want to show, you know, a JavaScript icon, you know, next to something, you need a way to do that because a terminal is only outputting characters, right? And so it means it needs to be baked into the font itself. And so when we look for what we want our monospace font to be, it means that we're probably going to pull from one of these nerd fonts so that we can come in here and say, you know, magnify, and it's going to have an icon that's set to it, right? Now, which ones do we want? How do we even figure that type of stuff out? If we come over here and look at uh, the nerd fonts repo, it actually tells us all the different fonts that are available for us if we wanted to uh, set up these fonts, you know, to be used within it. And this is all going to come down to personal choice. You probably have a font that you already like. Uh, I came from Max a long time ago, and for some reason, I'm still stuck on the Meslo font. Um, and so I like to install that one, which means all of these, even if they're available here, you could install them manually, but we're going to follow the way we've been doing things. And that's the nice part. If we install everything with um, the Arch user repository, then it means that we're going to have a really, really nice uh, way later to be able to back all this type of stuff up. Uh, so I know, you know, I could come in here and say our Meslo fonts, uh, and you'll see there's the uh, nerd fonts Meslo. So this is the one that we need, right? We just copy this out. Yay, dash S, nerd fonts, Meslo. Uh, and we now should be able to just go ahead uh, and make this installation. Right? Uh, should work. And when we come into our uh, fonts area that we saw before, hopefully we'll now see a bunch of Meslo fonts. Now, the Meslo fonts all have a bunch of like goofy names on here, like Meslo LGL. Uh, they're basically all just variations of the same uh, thing, different styling, you know, whatever you tend to like on something like this. Uh, but they all are a monospace font, which means it's good for code editing. So there's a couple places we want to change this stuff, right? So let's go back to that tweaks area. And in our fonts area, let's go change from source code pro regular. We want the Meslo I use, which one do I use? Gotta look this one up. Um, Meslo LGS Nerd Font Mono. This is, like I said, this is one of those settings that I just LGS Nerd Font Mono. Okay. Make this a little bigger so that we can see and make sure we're picking the correct thing. Nerd Font Mono LGS is the one. What is it? LGS DZ. Uh, there's so many different variations of this font. I just know that over time, the one that I really like is this nerd font mono regular one. Uh, so I'm going to go and set that, uh, which is going to make a whole bunch of mess uh, over here. Uh, let's see what happens. Was that just a dynamic thing that happened? Yeah. So uh, it looks like it's outputting it fine. So we've now changed our font that's going to be used as a default system font. A lot of other programs like Terminal uh emulators like um the gnome uh terminal are going to inherit the value from that so by setting these two values we've now set enter for our you know system interface type stuff and we've set uh meslo for a meslo nerd font for our you know mono spacey terminal type things so that's pretty good um at this point I need to set up a basic editor for myself. Uh, we've, you know, mostly gotten around by uh, working through menu systems. Yes, we've been doing some terminal stuff, but really just running command line. What we need to do now is we're going to start getting into actual configuration files and we're going to need to edit some stuff. So for me, 
that means that I'd like to work with a NeoVim. You are going to like to work in something else. So for example, uh, if you, most people tend to be uh, MS, uh, VS Code users these days. And if that's the case, you could just, again, go into the R, look for VS Code. Uh, this is the one that you're gonna wanna install. And you're gonna, believe it or not, works perfectly fine. Doesn't matter that it's on a Microsoft or a Mac machine. Um, it'll work fine and you'll be able to edit your files that way. Me, I need NeoVim. I have like various mnemonic things that have taken up a part of my brain. <laughs> and so not only do I need NeoVim, I need just a very, very basic set of uh, key mappings uh, that are probably gonna be pretty unique to me and you don't need to see me explain it. So I'm just going to set up a very, very minimal NeoVim file. And first let's go ahead and install it first. Um, we're going to install, what is it? It's NeoVim, I think. Uh, and while we do that, um, I'm also going to go to, I set up a gist uh, for this. So just in case people are curious, I want to see uh, what I mean by a minimal uh, uh, Vim setup. I'm not installing any plugins here. I'm just installing like, hey, turn on line numbers, uh, and then I have some mappings that are tied to my custom keyboard that are going to be unique to me. If you're curious about this, you can look at it. I wouldn't recommend just copying and pasting it. Like I said, you probably already have, uh, uh, you know, code uh, editor, you know, likes and dislikes. And if you don't, I highly recommend just using Visual Studio Code because it's it's going to just work by default. Vim is a lot of setup. We're going to set it up a whole lot in a later episode because I like nerding out about that stuff. But for right now, I just need a raw file. Now, here's a funny thing that happens is we actually need to be able to copy and paste things from this screen over to this screen we will generally have uh, problems and that's because of weirdness that's happening within uh, our uh, display system. And by our display system, I mean uh, the Wayland display uh, server that's going on in the background. Now, we haven't really talked too much about Wayland and there's not a whole lot that you need to know, but essentially um, uh, Wayland is a system for managing user input and uh, dis and doing the actual display that's that's sort of building these things. It's a deep, deep, deep part of the system uh, and GNOME is built on top of it. Now, unfortunately, GNOME does not ship with ways to manage the clipboard between, you know, as a bridge between these systems. You're gonna need an actual thing for that on top of it. Uh, and so we're going to also install something called WL clipboard um, and just trust me on this one. I know that you need it and I know that it's not there. In fact, let me just show you that it's not there. Uh, it does not come with our art system that we set up. So it doesn't have it available. So let's go ahead and install this. So WL clipboard. And what this is gonna do is just give us some default uh, systems that we can use to copy, uh, you know, some text. So hello, uh, when we run WL copy, it means then when we come over here and I hit uh, command uh, or control V, it's going to copy what I've got over there. The reason why this is important is various different programs within Linux like NeoVim uh, will assume that something like this exists. And that's gonna give you a way to talk between the you know, your display systems and uh, your terminal files are really just act as a bridge between uh, two different programs uh, using that clipboard manager because we need to know that a clipboard uh, exists. So now that we've got that, uh, <laughs> I know that this is like a very large preamble, but I promised you that we were gonna start from scratch and try to explain everything along the way. Uh, that means that we now can start putting this uh, NeoVim uh, this minimal one into our config file. So config files live uh, in your home directory. You won't see it when you do an ls, and that's because it's hidden. So you would need to do an ls-la, and you will see that there is a dot config folder. Anything that starts with a dot is going to be hidden. You're not going to see it by default. If we came into a files area and we looked in here in this home folder, we're not going to see that config folder there as well. 
uh, we would have to tell it to show hidden files uh, and then it's going to start putting that dot config file it's up to you whether you want that in your file browser but that's why it's not there if you're looking around for it so let's go into that config file and let's do an ls in there see what's there so we've got config files that were installed for pop shell we see one that's for GTK 4.0 and GTK 3.0. These are the files that come with GNOME that actually handle the styling. We're going to get to these a lot later when we want to actually re-theme the entire GNOME desktop. Uh, we're going to do that through some CSS. That's where you'd end up putting those files. Uh, we can see that we did install Yay and things got installed there as well. But for NeoVim, we're going to need to make a config file. So we're going to come in here and do a make directory. Uh, and I know that it needs to go in uh, NeoVim. So in that NeoVim directory, we now need to make a, uh, we need to edit a file called uh, init.vim. And we're going to take the contents of this just file that I have in here, which again, if you look at it, is mostly me just remapping some keys, uh, and we are going to paste it within here. And because we added that WL clipboard, we were able to paste between those things. If we tried to do that without that, a lot of the times the indentations, a lot of these things break, things come up all scrambled. That's why we needed uh, to add that. So at this point, again, I'm in Vim. I'm just going to right quit to close this one out. Uh, we're going to reopen it to see if it actually picked up. And I know that it picked up because I see some colors in here. They're really ugly colors, and we're going to fix that. Uh, but now we know that we have NeoVim running. Great. I've got a basic editor. That means that I can now show you off how to edit a bunch of these other config files. Uh, and it's not exactly what I want for NeoVim, but it's enough for me to navigate around and and not confuse people until I start introducing later Vim concepts. So now what are we doing? We talked about terminal, uh, terminal editors, right? Or terminal emulators. What we're now going to do is install the Alacrity terminal emulator. And if we just type Alacrity in Google, it's going to give us a screenshot of what that looks like. Uh, and it says Alacrity is a fast cross-platform OpenGL terminal emulator. What is a terminal emulator? Back in the day, you used to have big mainframe systems, right? So you had like a, a computer that would just sit in a room, right? And you needed to connect to it and you would have your display basically showing what was there. And so what they would call that would be an emulator, right? You're emulating what's actually happening within that machine. Um, and a lot of that nomenclature has kind of stuck around. Now, when we work inside of a terminal, we are doing two things. We're, we're using the terminal emulator to output the characters on that screen. That's what's actually doing the rendering side of it. The other thing that we're doing is we're writing a language and we're using an interpreter, almost always uh, the bash interpreter, uh, to be able, uh, or the bash shell, uh, to be able to you know write commands and invoke different things. So when we're typing commands in here, we're using uh, Bash to be able to do some of that stuff. Uh, and then it's being interpreted and then being displayed through our terminal emulator. Got it? <laughs> I know that these are kind of basics. Maybe you want to skip over this type of stuff. Uh, but for me, I really wanted to talk like everything that's going on within the Linux system. Um, so we're going to replace what we're using right now, which is the GNOME terminal, right? And that's this one that we've been using here. Uh, and we want to replace it with Alacrity. So we're going to do the normal thing that we always do, which is we're going to do a yay-s Alacrity. And we're going to put in our password. That's then going to install uh, the Alacrity system. And we now should be able to say which Alacrity uh, and it's telling us it's in user bin Alacrity. So let's clear. Let's just type Alacrity and see what happens. And you can see, oh, it's loaded up this other, you know, um, terminal emulator. So we've got GNOME terminal now loading up the Alacrity one. Uh, and uh, outside of just shipping with a dark mode by default, uh, 
Uh, it's got a bunch of other stuff, which we're going to talk about kind of why it's awesome. So let's close this out. We're going to close this terminal. Um, and we are going to do what we normally do when we add a program that we're, we know that we're going to use a lot. We're going to set up a keyboard uh, setting for it. So we're going to come into our keyboard setting. Remember this part from our previous episodes? We're going to come into view and customize shortcuts. We're going to go to the bottom where it says custom shortcuts. Cuts. That's where we added Firefox. We're now going to add one called Alacrity. Uh, and we're going to put the command that would invoke alacrity. So again, that's what we what we typed within uh, the terminal, and that's how we knew that it could run. We're now going to set a shortcut for it, which I'm going to set as Control Shift T, uh, and I'm going to add it. Which means now I should be able to just hit Control Shift T, and that is always going to load a new terminal for me and even better because we installed remember our uh, our uh, pop shell here right here uh, and we've got it set to tiling mode it means that we can um, have this stuff just auto tile for us in fact if we wanted to we could you know move stuff around as we needed to right maybe I want this on the top or the bottom and you're starting to see the power of the of these things kind of coming together uh, so let's go through. We only need one of these for the moment. Now that we've got Alacrity, what's the big deal? Like, why did we want this one in specific over GNOME Terminal? Really comes down to two different things, uh, maybe three. Uh, Alacrity is really fast. So it describes itself as OpenGL uh, base, which means it's going to use its GPU when it needs to render large pipelines of text. Sounds silly, but if you have large enough files that you're scrolling through, uh, having the GPU there, just like within your browser, can actually help quite a bit. Uh, the other part is it's got a really, really easy uh, to understand config file, uh, which I've just really appreciated over the years. Um, lastly, it, it's based on minimalism. Like, this is kind of all that it does. It renders things fast. Uh, you know, it shows a single window pane, and you can start typing stuff in it. Uh, and that's really it. So let me tell you things that it doesn't have. It doesn't have tabs. So like you can't make another tab of this Alacrity window um, because Alacrity is a minimal Unix first kind of uh, program where it's saying, look, we only do this one thing really well and that's it. So they're like, if you want tabbing, if you want management, window management type stuff, you should either be using a window manager like PopShell or you should be using something like Tmux, which is something that's going to split up your terminal panes and do whatever you need in it. That's, that's a valid point. Uh, it also keeps these folks from <laughs> needing to build like a huge bloat of software that's probably covered from a different piece of software that you should install. Now, you may not like that. If that's the case, you might want to look into the Kitty terminal. Um, there's a bunch of other ones that are out there. Uh, they all have their pros and cons. I just, over the years, I've gotten really, really uh, familiar with Alacrity, so it's what we're going to use for this. So just like NeoVim, Alacrity has a config file that we can kind of set. So uh, one thing that we can do is, and one nice advantage that I'm sure you'll appreciate, is we can now make the font larger. So by hitting uh, Control plus sign, we're going to get a font. Uh, we can come into our config folder, we can do an ls in it, and we see that there's that NeoVim one that we added, but there's not an Alacrity one. And why is it that we have a pop shell one that's automatically installed, but an Alacrity there isn't? And this comes down to something that's pretty contentious within the Linux sort of community and ecosystem, and it's where should config files live? How should they be installed? Should they just be in there by default? Should you have to add them? You're going to find that every software maintainer does this their own way. Uh, lots of people like the NeoVim maintainer and the Alacrity maintainer expect you to uh, like organically add your configuration files to be picked up uh, rather than um, have it installed and have you edit it. What that means is when we come through here and we look at configuration, uh, it's going to give us uh, a place where it's going to expect us to put a config file. Now, if the Linux systems are doing things correctly, they're going to use this global variable that is set within the Linux environment called XDG config home. And if that is set and exported within 
uh, the system that's being run, it's going to go to that folder to look for config files. Now, I wish that that was always used, but sometimes it isn't. And so that's why a lot of authors tend to say, here are other places that you can find it. So for us, what we'll do is we're just, we know that we're gonna want these all in this config folder at some point anyway. So we're just going to make a directory called Alacrity. And we are going to uh, jump into that folder and we are going to uh, edit a file called alacrity.yaml, which is what it told us uh, is the file that it needs to be named and will be picked up. Now, um, what, what can those configurations be? How, how can I find them? Every piece of software is going to be different. Sometimes there's going to be a wiki. Sometimes they're going to have a manual page where you, they have some of this type of stuff set up. Um, but in particular, in this case, uh, Alacrity does come with a YAML file. You can almost always find whatever their config file is within the root of uh, the source of the program itself. And so we can see this giant, 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 giant uh, file that lists all the settings that we could potentially have Alacrity pick up. So I'm just like that, uh, you know, gist that we uh, posted in for our NeoVim one, we're going to take this one just kind of whole hog uh, and we're going to copy paste it in here. And so uh, it's all of 895 uh, lines of code in here. We're now going to hit, uh, we're going to write this file so that it's in here. And you're going to see that nothing's changed. So we had that file in there. Uh, it's all at this moment commented out, which means nothing in it's going to be picked up. Now, as a YAML file, it means that it's all nested. So there's a tree to this. Uh, there's um, window, then dimensions, then columns. Uh, and this is following uh, an indentation level to be able to pick some of this type of stuff up. So for us to be able to change some of these things, like as a good example, we're not going to change too much because Alacrity is pretty good by default. Uh, but we there are a couple things that we want to make sure that we get. Uh, let's change the padding uh, that's on this. So for example, right now it's up flush against the edge. I wanna make the padding um, have a little bit of breathing room on it. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to uncomment this window portion, then we're going to uncomment this padding portion, and then we're going to uncomment the X and the Y. If we go ahead and save this, we'll see nothing changed here. Uh, but if we change this to 16, you'll see uh, that it shifted for us and it's applied that. That's another reason I love Alacrity is it auto sources itself. So as you change the config file, it's going to change that config file. It's going to pick it up in any open Alacrity windows, which is super duper duper awesome, right? Um, so, you know, let's just show it off a little bit more. Let's pick another base four number. So let's pick 64 and you can see, right? It's picking this stuff up. So that's great. Uh, one thing uh, else that we mentioned that we wanted to do on here, uh, we can also, you'll notice that there's some scrolling that's happening on here. Uh, if we come through the document uh, and we look for scrolling, we can see that there is a scrolling distance multiplier. So example, do you want to change the scroll speed that's on here? You could turn scrolling off. Uh, the one that's in here is always going to be the default one. So if we wanted to double that speed, we would turn it to six and we can see uh, what gets changed on that side of it. I tend to keep mine at three, uh, but that's something that's in there. Uh, another one is the font, right? So by default, it's going to pick up uh, the the font that's in here that's that's being used. And so, yes, I know that we set it at a system level. It's almost always smart to also set these things down at the actual application level as well. So we're gonna go down to font. Uh, we're going to go to uh, normal here, uh, and then we're gonna change the family. And we're gonna change that font family to what we set before, which let me try and remember it. See how I close my eye like this, this should, let me know what I do, and I believe it is Meslo. I, I, I'm totally lying. I'm looking at a cheat sheet that I wrote for myself. Meslo LGS, 
nerd font mono. Uh, and if we set that, you can see now that it's changed our font side there. And this is a perfect example of why we make sure to do these things. Just because we set it at a system level up top, yes, that got passed down to the GNOME terminal. It did not get passed to Alacrity because Alacrity is overwriting it by default. And so we need to go in there and actually change that setting uh, to be able to then go and use it. So uh, by doing that side of it, uh, we can uh, see what it's done on here. It also has a point size on it. So rather than me needing to hit control plus 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 a million times for you, I'm going to make everybody's lives easier and I'm just going to set it to size 18. Now this is not what I would normally use when I'm using my system, uh, but I'm guessing that it's probably a little more helpful for uh, you folks. Thanks for sticking with me till we actually got to this part uh, within our customization side. Um, but we're now at a point where uh, we've got this stuff, um, you know, loaded up and it's going pretty good. So right now we've got Alacrity set up. I notice we're roughly around 30 minutes, so this is probably a pretty good place to end. Uh, we've got Alacrity set up as our uh, terminal. We've been able to customize uh, little bits of it. Um, this is generally, to be honest, I don't touch too much in, in, uh, in Alacrity, I change some spacing, I change the font, uh, and I do change the color. Let's do that really quickly. Uh, so almost everything is themable within um, Linux, and Alacrity is no different. Uh, so we can come in here. Let's go for Alacrity themes. I think, is this the one we want? Yeah. So there's tons and tons and tons and tons of different themes that are out there for Alacrity. You could either install this uh, yourself if you wanted to. Uh, I'm going to just do the easier way. Like I don't need a billion themes. I just need one. And in fact, I know that I'm going to change this theme a lot later on. Uh, so I'm just going to grab this, uh, uh, this base 16 theme, right? You can see by default tomorrow night is the one that's installed in here. Uh, but we're just going to use instead, uh, and this comes uncommented. Uh, we're using base 16 dark. So let's go ahead and write this file and you can see that it changed the coloring on there. Now it changed it here. It didn't change it up here. And I don't know if you pick that up. This one's a lighter gray. The reason is, is because NeoVim is running on top of it. And even though NeoVim is inheriting from Alacrity, uh, it needs to be restarted. Now we're going to later on when we get into NeoVim, even learn how we can have that get auto picked up as well. Uh, but for now, what we're all we need to do is sort of write our file and reload uh, our uh, Alacrity uh, file, and we can see that uh, it has picked up. Well, hold on. In this case, there we go. Now let's go into uh, where were we? Config, Alacrity, NeoVim. Alacrity.yaml. Now you can see the coloring that's in there. So sometimes you do need to refresh the terminal that's there, uh, but we have basic color scheme stuff in here. It may not be your favorite thing in the world. In fact, like why is the you know coloring of the comment stuff not the same? But we'll worry about that later. We don't want to spend too much time on the editor. Um, that kind of closes it out. I think next episode. What we're going to want to start covering is uh, the actual shell that we're using. So we're going to convert from bash to fish shell. Uh, at this point, now that we're writing config files, I'm starting to get scared about all, my, all the work I'm putting into this, and I need to figure out a way to save this stuff. So we're probably going to start learning about how we uh, start backing up our system and our config files that are living within home. Anyways, that's about it. I hope you've been having fun with these series and uh, enjoying it as we go along. We're going to get to someplace really, really cool by the end. It's just going to take us a while to get there. I'll see you all.